Okay, okay, simmer down everyone, it's me, your instructor for the duration of this lesson. <coughs> Put your phone away. And pay attention. Welcome. Today we're going to take a look at the common phrases or terms found in hacking. This isn't an official list or some sort of top 10, but it's still the stuff I see floating around all the time, and most of the time, misconstrued. Let's not waste any more time, let's just jump straight into it. Of course, okay. When you hear the word hacker, I can imagine a couple of things appearing in your mind. Number one, you think of those cyber terrorists bombarding people with their exploits and their tactics and their schemes. No, that's not all hackers. Yeah, unfortunately those people exist and we've got a name for them or more specifically, we've got a, a, a skull sock for them. These types of hackers are called black hats. Ooh, scary. Just think of the symbiote Spider-Man and that's pretty much what we're dealing with here. A black hat means exactly what you think it does. These are the bad hackers. What the fuck? <laughs> and and these kind and these are the kinds of people that unfortunately give hacking the, the stigma that it has right now. Whether it's for money or just for kicks, these guys will hack you if given the chance and, and they'll laugh at you when they do it. Yo, Aiden, this is my friend. He would be, in my opinion, what we call a gray hat. Uh never mind. Aiden, you f mess of terrorists. Why are you killing people? Sorry about that. Okay. Where were we? Oh yeah, okay, gray hats. These are the hackers that aren't really going out of their way to violate any laws, but they may still do it from time to time. Think of vigilantes, kind of like an anti-hero, not as pious as a hero, but not as malicious as a supervillain. These guys can definitely help, but they may ask you for your firstborn as payment. I'm kidding. They demand it. In 2008, the F and F defined these vigilantes as ethical security researchers who inadvertently or arguably violate the law in an effort to research and improve security. These guys most likely would hack you purely from a curiosity standpoint, and then they'd most likely tell you about it so you could fix your shit. These are the goody two shoes. They'd sooner massacre an entire lineage of ancient orphans than attack you without your written and explicit permission in order to do so. They find a vulnerability and they're reporting it. T minus yesterday. I'm not mocking white hats. If you're joining this field, you're gonna spend a really long time learning what to do and what not to do when it comes to hacking. It's going to be drilled into your hippocortegdola, and you better keep the oath, lest you become a framed poster in the warm, cozy house of the FBI. Interpol and all those fellas. You better believe that hacking is a real life superpower, but as Benjamin Don't start up with me. Parker once said, With great power comes great responsibility. Okay, believe it or not, there are actually various types of hats out there, exceeding past the bad, the morally questionable, and the salt of the earth. Since this video might be the beginning of a series where I explain a bunch of these terms, I won't cover them here, but let me know if you want me to cover it. And that goes for anything covered here. If you want me to cover it more in depth or want me to cover something else, just comment down below. This is probably the most misconstrued thing I see. Look, I'll be brief because I'll probably make a video solely on this about this later, but just think of an IP address as the address of your device, like how you have an address of your home. It's the same thing. So your device uses the internet protocol IP to communicate, right? When you think about the typical IP address, you're most likely thinking about the IPv4 or the internet protocol version four format, which is x.x.x.x or dot decimal notation. And what the f an IP address is 32 bits and each octet is 8 bits. Each octet can have a value from 0 to 255. And there are some common reserved address ranges out there like 192. blah blah blah, 10. blah blah blah, or 172.16 blah blah blah. And these are kept for certain purposes like home ranges, office address ranges, etc. You, you may even notice that your device is sticking to some of these conventions right now if you check. Since there are only a limited amount of addresses, it's IPv4, which has around 4.3 billion possible addresses, and we only have a few left. Which brings us to our next version. You'll see all the time ipv6 same thing but this version provides practically never ending ip addresses for us to use and, and the naming convention is a bit weirder but both are just your computer's address next there are two kinds of ips a public ip and a private ip a public ip is an ip that others can use to find you on the internet if you go to a website the ip of that site is its public ip the private ip is what a device on the local network would see and communicate with. Now most devices, when connected to a network, will have both a public and private IP. Make sure to get this right. For all those script kiddies out there saying stupid shit like, I have your IP, prepare to be hacked. And it's just something like 192.168.014 or this shit or this. All of us here are laughing at you each and every time. 
And if someone ever comes to you with that, trying to scare you, just point at them and laugh and tell them to do their worst. To finally conclude this section, in case you don't completely get IPs yet, that's okay. I'll explain why all three of these examples were laughable, starting with the first one. The first one is a private IP, okay? It wouldn't make sense for someone to say that they were gonna hack us and give us that IP if they weren't in our network, either physically or through a VPN. And it's the same thing for other reserved IP addresses like the 10s and the 17216, you know what I mean? The second example violates the 0 to 255 range for each octet. Remember that the highest an IP can be is 255, 255, 255, 255, which has a special name called a broadcast address, but that's for another video. Lastly, the final example is a specially reserved IP, which you can think of as the IP of your own machine. It's called the local host, or uh, it's some people think of it as home, which is why sometimes you'll see floor mats online that say something like local host suite, local host, because it, it could be seen as home sweet home. So it wouldn't make sense for someone to give you this IP in that context because it would be the equivalent of saying, hey, you. Yeah. Guess what? I'm gonna hack my own machine. Okay, what? Like, who are you? A port is a communication endpoint. It's used to identify specific processes or services running on a device. Each one of these portable services has its own typical number. Like HTTPS, what you're using right now hopefully to watch this video, is port number 443. And there's TCP and UDP, but just think of the number for now. And there are 65,535 ports out there. That's a lot of potential services you can be using. And sometimes even though something like SSH mainly runs on 22, port 22, you can sometimes even change it to another port. <laughs> one time I was doing a CTF, and this was way back in the day, I'm talking about my pre-EJPT arc. And there was this machine with two ports open. There was HTTP, which is like HTTPS, but considerably less secure. So on port 80, which is its typical designation, and SSH, so port 22. And they were f***ing switched. And I was none the wiser, so I spent a disgusting amount of time trying trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I had just started out and my enumeration skills were complete garbage. So remember, these things usually can be run on a port of your choosing, but they typically stick to their typical designation. Like a common one for another HTTP thing is 8080. It really depends, but you'll see it when you enumerate the service itself. And now an analogy to better understand ports. Think of an office building with all the stupid amount of rooms in it. Each room is a specific service like HTTP for the web, FTP for file transfers, etc. denoted by their room number. Think of the door as the port. It's what you walk through or connect to in order to use the service you're trying to use. They're shown in the following way. You have the IP and then the port, right? Concatenated with a colon. I thought I told you to put your phone away at the beginning of this class. Uh-uh. I've got a special place for you. Oh no! Okay, and that's pretty much a firewall. A firewall will monitor something. It doesn't always have to be a website. It could be, you can have entire machines acting as a firewall or just a web application firewall or something. But the essence of these HWs is the same across any implementation. A firewall will prevent access to something unless it's explicitly allowed to pass through the firewall. If you're hosting a super secret Bonesaw McGraw Ultimate Super Fan Club meeting on a super secret forum online and don't want anyone to just peer in, set up a firewall. And now you and your dedicated McGraw McMen can have your meetups in peace. This isn't completely foolproof. Listen, if you just set up an IP like whitelist, you say, these are the IPs I want to join this meeting and no one else, there's nothing stopping someone to just spoof their IP, but you know, it's a start. If you think about a castle, the moat is the firewall and the castle itself is the service. And without the drawbridge giving you explicit permission to bypass the moat, there's no way you're going in. Got it? So, it looks like you made your choice, huh? Instead of all I've said, you thought it to be cool or powerful to go to the dark side and choose to align yourself with the Romulan equivalent of the hacking community? Okay, let's play out how your first malicious hacking campaign goes. You, through the skin of your teeth, somehow make it past the firewall and find yourself on the internal network. Ooh, here you Look at all these potential victims. Hmm, I'll choose this one. <laughs> Idiot. You fell for one of the oldest tricks in the book, a honeypot. Honeypots are traps meant to lure in potential attacks or malicious actors looking to gain access to a system or a network without permission. They're usually heavily logged and recorded, but they're not always just to capture malicious hackers. They can sometimes be used to divert a hacker's attention from the more sensitive and important machines. They can be used to figure out how attackers get in or to trace the path of an attack back to its origin. Sometimes they can even be used in order to train professionals. This attack 
fortunately is popular enough that most of you already know what it is, but if you don't, let's just go over it. A denial of service attack or DOS, DOS, is an attack in which you overload a system's processes, softwares, or whatever's capacity to input or process data. In other words, you supply more than it can handle, and it'll most likely crash the service, hence denial of service. I'm <laughs> getting some serious flashbacks over here. If you owned a website back in the day, you could have your website completely crash from some simple requests, i.e. by simply sending a bunch of requests to a site, you could simply crash it and prevent users from accessing the service. And getting your service or site to just go down like that costs a lot of money as well. So it's a pretty devastating attack if the target can't fend it off. This is insanely rare nowadays with better request processing endpoints and DDoS mitigation services like Cloudflare, Azure, Imperva, etc. Oh yeah, this section is DDoS, not DOS. Okay, think of denial of service except on cyber steroids. That's DDoS or distributed denial of service attack. The same thing as before, except this time instead of one machine making multiple requests or something, you have a distributed army of machines barraging the target at once. Again, these attacks aren't as common anymore because of how many resources it typically takes to do an effective attack like this nowadays, but that isn't to say that you won't see them around, especially extremely gigantic ones. I mean, let's take a look at this. Microsoft has revealed that it stopped a 3.47 terabyte per second DDoS attack. That's the biggest one in history. 3.47 terabytes of data per second. Can you even fathom that? Okay, this is the last thing we'll talk about in today's class. I know, I know, but hey, listen, this is sort of intended to be a series. So let me know what else you'd like me to try to cover down below in the comments and I'll add it in for part two. A server for me, besides DNS, for some reason, was the hardest thing to understand in my head. It took some time because for some reason, everyone seemed to have a different idea of what these abstract things were. Like in movies, you'd see a server room and there's just lines and lines of these server racks. From games, you'd see somewhat the same things. And in real life, you'd hear about web servers, file transfer servers, SSH servers, etc. Just listen to me. Don't make the mistake that I made. The way I think about servers now is literally just a computer or device that's serving a service. That's it. Do you have an old piece of sh laptop running a website on it? No, you don't fella. That there's a web server. You have SSH running on your smartwatch? Mm -mm -mm. That's an SSH server. You have a typewriter that writes horrific messages to you while you're sleeping so that your first moments from the warm mercy of sleep are terrifying realizations that you have a cursed object with ancient demonic residue piling on it that you thought was rust? That's a dire need of an exorcism. Point stands, don't get too caught up in what everyone else says. A server is simply something that serves something to other devices. Ever since thinking about it like that, you can and you will see them thrown around online everywhere you go. And while we're on it, say we have an FTP server, which we just discussed, is just a computer or something running FTP on it, and we connect to it. We, because we connected to it, are the client, okay? That's client server nomenclature simplified. There, that's that. Thank you so much if you've made it this far. This is my second video ever on this channel and I, I wanted to take a second to thank you all for the love that my first video has been getting. I was not expecting this. Seriously, it really makes me happy to see that people are enjoying it, commenting and interacting with it. I don't even know what I was expecting. Remember that these are just passion projects for me. But to see a graph like this in the first week, not even first week of my video, it's really, really empowering. Thank you all, seriously. I, I can't wait to keep making videos for all of us. Stay tuned for the next one. And until next time, goodbye.